right, guys, I'm gonna try doing this PowerPoint thing from my house, hopefully it works out. Sorry for interruptions, including jiggling of that thing, barking of the dog, you know he's deaf. Someone came like 10 minutes ago, he's still barking. So this is where we were supposed to do, had we had shown up this week, which is chapter 19, and I'm only gonna do stuff in half hour excerpts because that's all that I can seem to get YouTube to upload. It took me forever to try and do another one. So we're doing, Chapter 19, we've started the section on evolution and it's gonna be about Darwin. So most of this stuff is a repeat and you know we start with stuff that has nothing to do with anything that's gonna, anyone's gonna test you on. So do we care about moths and butterflies? Yes, they're beautiful, fabulous. Thanks for taking up a slide for that one, okay? No one's gonna ask you on the species name of butterflies. Hope you guys can, you know, pay attention with the dog in the background because I can't beat him because he's old. Oh, look, there are leaves, there's a caterpillar. Thank goodness you all got that one, okay? So, Darwin. We're gonna learn more than we wanted to know about Darwin. We're gonna go through it quickly because they're not gonna ask you specifics about Darwin. We may get distracted because Darwin was kind of a wuss, and obviously, it seems like she's the greatest nice in sliced bread, but he wasn't really that bright in like schooling, so hey, just in case you're not doing good, doesn't mean you can't do things. Come on, keep the attitude. All right, here we go. Oh, good luck. All right, don't beat the dog, yeah. So, we're gonna go with what we start with, with evolution. Yeah, we're trying to go with the dog, it's not working. So we have Darwin's phrase, and obviously over the course of many years, it's been tweaked, descent with modification, we all had that concept um, in our minds. I'm going, hold on, I'm going to pick up the dog. I know, we're gonna pause. Sorry, we'll keep going. Dog, Spike, everyone, stop disrupting. Shh, you can't hear, okay? So Darwin's phrase, descent with modification. We already know survival of the fittest, which is kind of like a tweaked type of thing, and that's really not what it is, but we'll talk about that. I'll talk. You'll pretend you're listening, you know, some of you that always do. It's hard, the only you know input I'm getting is from the cat, and obviously the dog's right here, so it's hard to tell if any of y'all are paying attention or not. So, here are some, Iguana, in case we haven't seen any of those. Marines from the Galapagos, you know, his island. So, not his island, but you know, the, the famous island. Work with me, folks. You know, they put a lot of pictures in here that were like, what? So we kind of have to just keep going. So it started with Aristotle. We don't care. We certainly don't care about the Old Testament. Sorry, you know my feelings about that one. And they're not gonna test you on the Old Testament in AP Bio, all right? Linnaeus, important. One of the people whose names you need to know, you don't need to know everyone's name, Linnaeus you need to know because of taxonomy. He's the guy that came up with the two-word two -ne naming system, binomial nomenclature. You all already know this because everyone passed the EOC for biology. He, um, oh look, it says it right there. There's Homo sapiens. Oh my God, look at this. I had an evolutionary uh, biology professor that if you didn't freaking write it in italics, the first, this has to be capitalized, this has to be lowercase, and because you can't write italics in handwriting, if you didn't underline it, it was like wrong. It's like you get that thing wrong once and then you, you, you got it for the rest of the semester, okay? And Linnaeus went in with describing, because this was all he had back then, describing how they looked like each other, which is really just morphology, which is one of the many things we take into consideration, all right? So, how do we start studying this? We're gonna talk about um, sedimentary rock where you can look at fossils. We all know what a fossil is. It's found in the little strata or layers. Oh, look, Grand Canyon. No, we're not gonna play any of the videos. You know there are 50 videos. Go enjoy videos of the Grand Canyon on your own time, okay? So here you can see the different layers and how they do it different ways. Oh, now you're done with me? You're done with me now? Are you gonna stop barking? Okay, I'm gonna put you down. Okay, so what they did was they knew some things were around different times and if, guess what, if this, they found this and it was below this, this was older because this was nearer to the top. Look, it's like rock science. I know, that was wrong. Okay, so then we have paleontology. Are we doing much on paleontology? No, but these are little pieces of evidence we have that evolution occurs those people who don't believe in evidence of evolution, we do have evidence. 
and paleontology oh, oh. is one. Oh, look, the dog didn't continue to bark. So, what we oh. have, the French scientist, George, that's probably not how you say his name, oh. Cuvier, remember, you never need to know the first guy's first name. Oh. You need to know Cuvier has to do with paleontology, okay, oh. which is the study of fossils. Okay, oh. he's saying that each boundary between strata represents a catastrophic oh. event that might have like wiped everything out, so that's how come new things developed. We know that has some degree oh. of um, correctness. Is that, the, is that the term? I don't know. So then we have Hutton and Lyle. And this is huge. Hutton, Lyle, huge. Must know Hutton and Lyle because look at what they're saying. They perceive that changes in the Earth's surface can result from slow, continuous actions that are still operating today. Because back in the 1800s, they were still going with that theological approach, you know, God, everything, oh. seven days, six days, I don't know which day they worked, they didn't work. Oh. But to say stuff was still changing, that was huge. And geologic processes, oh. huge. So please know Hutton and Lyle that the Earth's surface changed over time. Because this would have impact on Darwin. Oh, oh look, it says it right there. And then we have Lamarck. Okay, Lamarck, also, there are a lot of people, so please make sure you note, I don't know, flashcards, however it is, you're going to le learn the different people's names. Lamarck hypothesized that species evolved through use and disuse. Okay, so that was the concept that you've heard of, that giraffes stretched their necks, and because they stretched their necks, that the next generation of giraffes had longer necks. We know that's not true, we, but it, the good idea was that he believed that things could change over time. He believed in the concept of evolution. His um, actions behind why it occurred were incorrect, but the fact that he understood that evolution occurred, that things changed over time, was a big deal in the scientific community. We now know, at least I do, and now you will, and you did because you passed the bio EOC, is that what happened was some giraffes, we'll stick with the giraffe one, some giraffes just by some genetic mutation had necks that were a little bit longer. Okay, and because their necks were a little bit longer, they were able to reach leaves that were a little bit higher. And because those leaves were a little bit higher, they had a larger food source. If they had a larger food source, guess what? They were healthier, and guess what they had? Then they could have more sex. So if you had more sex, then your genes were passed on more. And that's how giraffes over time develop longer necks. Because some type of original mutation or a variation because of, you know, sexual reproduction. Ooh, we did those chapters. If you don't remember how that works, please go back to meiosis. Okay? Dog is still deaf. He has no idea. He turned around looking at the couch and barking at it. Sorry, folks. There's a bonsai tree. I got no idea what to do with that one. Okay? Descent with modification. We'll get into that. So, here's the thing with Darwin. We're going to go through it pretty quickly. Darwin was not the first child, and you know how it worked back then in Great Britain or whatever it is that we we're talking about, is that the first son got the plantation or the farm or whatever it was called, the estate, and the second one, they had to figure out something to do with it. Poor dude. He went into medicine, didn't do very well, and so then his dad, I can't make this crap up, his dad was friendly with Captain Robert Fitzroy's dad, who was obviously um, the captain of the HMS Beagle. And so they wanted someone else, the captains always wanted a naturalist because they wanted someone of their intelligence level and also their class to be on these long voyages so they would have someone to talk to because you know most of the other people that were on the ships were uneducated, some have been forced into doing it, you know, European history better than I do, folks. So because of that, Darwin kind of, went on as an unpaid naturalist because what other job are you going to have? And at least he was fed. So that's how it started. About five years. And look, I looked it up because it doesn't say here. He started the voyage in 1831. It was for five years. He started at the age of 22. Keep that in mind. Write that down or put it to memory because we're going to add to that later. Look, my one note that I got going on there. So we know he collected animals. We know the voyage that he went into. And he started thinking about things and how what he found in the Galapagos Island resembled what was in South America, but didn't resemble what was over and what he knew over in Europe. Okay. Notice he was influenced by, by Lyle's geology. We already went through that. How that the earth was actually changing features that we had on the earth were changing over time. 
and that oh, the earth was more than 6,000 years old? No kidding. Ta-da. Huge because of religion. I mean, you know, back then religion was it. So he observed all of these things and he saw fossils and Darwin was able to relate to that with what he saw in his voyage. Now seeing things and drawing a line between the two, we know that's the hardest part. So his interest in graphic distribution of species was kindled by the stop at the Galapagos Islands west of South America. Yeah, just in case you didn't know where the Galapagos Islands were. All right, so he started putting these things together. And it's fascinating. Well, I guess he had a lot of spare time for five years on a ship, right? So what he hypothesized is that species from South America had colonized the Galapagos and they had um, radiated out from there. That's why they were so similar more to each other on the islands and then to the mainland. And he could see how that worked. And we'll see that because once again, you can go look at the courtship video. I know you guys are very disappointed, but I have no idea how that would work on here. We know it's iffy in classroom and I'm just, you know, oh, go do this, do this, please, please. You do my favorite animals. You know, the blue footed booby is my favorite courtship video. Watch, 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 still dance. I know, I know this is sad, but you should. Here's my, here's my sexy blue foot. Here's my sexy blue foot. Here's my sexy blue foot. Did I do the dance good enough? Now we are together. I know, it's better when they do it, but you can work with me there. Okay, there are the iguanas. Lots of pictures. Woo! We're going through these 119 slides like there was nobody's business. Five years, that's what he did. Look, he returned in 1840. Keep that in mind. 1840, he returned. Okay. There's a bigger picture. You know, they always have, oh, better picture of Charles. Look at that. Can anyone else carry off the mutton chops? I don't think so. Oh, Galapagos, thank you. There's a ship. Okay, all right. So, Darwin perceived adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species as closely related processes. So, we have expanded upon what Darwin thought. And it has been tweaked over, what, 150 years or whatever it is. And biologists have since concluded that the diverse group of Galapagos finches arose from ancestral forms by the gradual accumulation of adaptations. So if they came in, if they got blown in from Ecuador onto the Galapagos Island, maybe the first island they land on had a bunch of flowers. So then they had to go and they had to get nectar. That's going to give you a specific type of beak. But then maybe a couple got blown onto the next island. It didn't have those flowers. It had things with seeds. Well, getting into seeds, you need a different beak to get in than you do then to get into nectar. And that's how that radiation happened. So it's called, specifically, adaptive radiation. And we see that in Darwin's finches. Also, if you get really bored, you can see that in different types of fruit flies in the Hawaiian Islands, or also honey creepers in the Hawaiian Islands. They have their own type of bird that are specifically there that are found no place else. An endemic species. So look at this, okay? Cactus eater. Here you have the insect eater. Look at their beak. Compared to, look at how thick that beak is of a seed eater. All right? But just looking at them, you could see that they all must have some distant relative. Here's closer, 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 closer. Okay? So in 44, he wrote an essay on natural selection. Okay? What did we say? He landed in 30? He wrote an essay in 44 as the mechanism of descent with modification, but did not introduce his theory publicly. You know why? I know. You're wondering. You're like, dude, why didn't you do it? Get it published. His wife, I'm not going to make this stuff up. You could research it, okay? His wife was like, listen, the only thing we have around here is like to go to religious functions and to have tea with the ladies. Okay, if you start saying that the church is wrong by publishing it, who am I going to play with? What am I going to do with my spare time? I can't make this stuff up, folks. So Darwin put off publishing it until, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I know, you're waiting, you're waiting, I can tell. So, natural selection is a process in which individuals with favorable inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. Think about and go back to our example that we just did with the giraffes, okay? My neck is longer, I can get to more leaves, I have a better food supply, therefore I'm healthier. If I'm healthier, I can have more sex, I can then pass off, the, pass off these genes to more. 
Okay? So here's what caused Darwin to publish. Look, now we're in freaking 58, okay? And that's 1958. No, it's 1858. I didn't type these up, okay? We know that this happened in the 1800s. So um, in 1858, he received a manuscript from Russell Wallace, who developed a theory of natural selection similar to Darwin's. What he did was, instead of going over towards South America, he went around to India, and he came up with the exact same conclusions. And why we don't hear as much about Wallace as we do about Darwin, even though, look, they presented together, is because Darwin brought home five years worth of dead things in jars. All right? So Darwin had way more evidence that he had collected, especially of his finches and things like that, whereas Wallace had just written down his theories when he went over to... Um, when he went over towards India in that, in that direction, the opposite direction, you know, east, west, north, south, those things confuse me. So he went in the total opposite direction of the HMS Beagle, oh. and he came up with the same conclusions, but he just didn't have as much evidence. So that's why Darwin gets all the props. Okay, here we're throwing a little bit of them. But if you know about evolution, who's the oh. first guy you think of? You don't go, oh, Wallace. No, you go on the origins of species by means of natural selection, which is Darwin. Oh. Okay. Dude, it's a frog. I don't even know what to tell you with that one. There's a closer frog. There's a guy. I don't know who that is. I'm going to go with Wallace because it's not Darwin. Okay. So, this is what Darwin explained, and he had these in his observations. He actually wrote this stuff up. The unity of life, the diversity of life, the match between organisms and their environment. We can take that now, guys, and look at what's happening to climate change. I know you might have to put these things together. A, B, straight line. You gotta figure it out, okay? He never used the term evolution, which is kind of freaky, okay? Because that's what we always associate. Evolution, Darwin, evolution, Darwin, we got that. The phrase descent with modification summarized Darwin's perception of the unity of life. So, once again, giraffes, offspring, long necks, offspring with long necks, okay? So the phrase refers to the view that all organisms are related through descent from an ancestor that lived in their remote past. Ta-da. Okay. So fossils help tie that in. And a lot of people who have problems with evolution are like, there is no fossil evidence. There's not consistent fossil evidence. Well, if you go back beyond, I don't know, vertebrates, really, when you get into shelled things, squishy things don't fossilize. You don't, you're not like, wow, let me go to the museum and look at the fossilized history of jellyfish. Sorry, jellies. Because they only have squishy parts. So you can't see that change over time. You can't see physiological changes. You can't see how organisms move from endothermic to, from ectothermic to endothermic, okay? From cold-blooded to warm-blooded. Because those are physiological changes. You can't see those. Fossil evidence is only like hard things that crunchified. That's not technical. Okay, look at how, uh, look at that. See, I think some of your handwriting looks just like that, okay? It's just that bad, all right? And this would be a phylogenetic trait that Darwin wrote, okay? And here's what we have. Once again, when you read these phylogenetic trees, cladogram, whichever one you want to talk about, remember, here they have some common ancestor and something that differentiated this from this, okay? Whatever it might be. Here, maybe it's big ears. Look, this Asian elephants don't have big ears. These do. I'm making stuff up. I have no idea what the what the difference is when we go through here. Dog's coming in. Here it is closer, closer, closer. So, Darwin noted that humans have been modifying it. No kidding. Humans have been modifying stuff. We call it artificial selection. So, the fact that we have broccoli, cauliflower, mustard seeds, and they all came from some plant that we then chose and selected for artificial selection. So he went through and he's like, listen, now we have chickens that we like um, to have white meat, but we don't like them to have dark meat, so we breed them. Okay, I'm picking up the dog again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And he's so hot and unlike our classroom, my, my house is the correct temperature, except, you know, when I pick up a hot dog. Okay, not as in a, a dachshund, but as in my temperature. So you know how I digress. I get distracted enough as it is in the classroom. So Darwin argued that a similar process has got to occur in nature, and this has to be true. Well, that's what we're going with with the theory of evolution. Oh, look, it's the mustard one. Oh, go me. 
It's like I've seen these slides before. All related to wild mustard. We picked it out. This is, I want the leafy part. I want the, the bud part. I don't, wild part, okay? Oh, now you have to look at it closer, closer, closer. Who doesn't like that? Ooh, look at the dog. He's doing cute things. Hi, everyone, pay attention, pay attention. Thank you. Okay, so here are his observations. Do not memorize them. Understand the concept. No one is going to ask you what was observation number three. Okay, I'm just saying. No one's going to ask you that. But you need to see how the process worked. Okay, observation one, members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. <gasps> no! Variations? No kidding. How does that happen? If you don't remember how variations occur, you better go back and look at meiosis. You didn't get that right. Go back and look at meiosis. Just saying. Oh, shuffling together. Oh, ladybugs. You know, every single one of their dot patterns is different. There's some useless trivia to get on Jeopardy. Okay, observation number two. All species can produce more offspring than the environment can support, and many of these offspring fail to survive and reproduce. Think, for example, um, frogs. You're like, I don't think about frogs, but work with me on a minute. Think about frogs, how many eggs they lay. Say they lay a million eggs. I'm making crap up. They don't lay a million eggs. Okay, then out of those million eggs, then we have, you know, three billion sperm. You know, they do that on a, in, in the water. We'll go with frogs that are doing this in the water. Okay, so then how many fertilized eggs do we get? Maybe we get 500,000. Once again, I'm making these numbers up because I have no idea. And then those 500,000 fertilized eggs, they are yummy snack food for fishes. So maybe out of that, only like 100 of them make it into tadpoles. You know, some tadpoles are cannibals. Others are not. So maybe out of all of those, only, I don't know, out of those, whatever number I said, because I'm not listening to myself talk, as you're well aware, say we only get um, 50 of them that make it to be adult frogs. Then they move on to land. How many of them get snatched up by another type of frog, by a fish? Um, they just don't make it. And a bird, something eats them. So all they need at that point is out of the million egg that they started with, remember, I don't remember what number I said, maybe two of them make it to adulthood. They produce more than the than not than the environment is going to be able to contain. Go look at videos of seahorses. The daddies have little patches, pouches, you know, and they're the ones that are pregnant. It's so cute. Okay. This is a mass release of something. I don't know. It looks like oh, mold. It's just releasing spore cloud. Okay, into the air. It's like the concept of pollen. Okay. So. And here are things that he inferred. Once again, no one's going to ask you for his inferences. Individuals who inherited the trait give them a higher probability of surviving. Oh, those best adapted for the environment? No way! They will reproduce more in a given environment to leave more offspring than other individuals. Wow, I just messed that statement up, but you've got this. I have, I have a feeling. Inference number two, this unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits. And that's how organisms over time adapt, who go through sexual reproduction. Because we can remember way back to bacteria, that bacteria, they just do cloning. Uh -huh. And in the evolutionary um, adaptation concept, the original source of variation, mutation, right. So please remember, mutation, if you're a single-celled organism, that's the only way you're gonna get genetic variation. And then once we get into sexual reproduction, here we go. So Darwin was influenced by Malthus, who noted the potential for human population to increase faster than food supplies. Malthus was all about that people are finally going to stop reproducing because we're going to run out of food. We found out that's not true. I don't know. Is this it? Are we going to run? I thought it was going to be water. Okay. Who knows what's going to hold the human population in control so far? Nothing. Okay. If some heritable traits are advantageous, these will accumulate in a population over time, and this will increase the frequency of individuals with these traits. This process explains the match between organisms and their environment. That's why if the environment changes too rapidly, organisms cannot keep up, which is what's happening with climate change. I'm just saying it, throwing it out there. Contrary to whatever the federal government is saying, we know it's happening. Okay? Individuals with certain heritable traits survive and reproduce at a higher rate than other individuals because they're better adapted to the environment. So if you're healthier, if you're a sturdier individual, 
you're more able to go through whatever the reproductive process is. We know we've seen it with birds, how they make a nest. We've seen it with animals. It could be uh, some interest specific competition. Okay. Over time, natural selection increases the frequency of adaptations that are favorable in a given environment, which is great so long as that environment is not changing. If an environment changes over time, natural selection may result in adaptations to these new conditions that may give rise to a new species. That's how we get them. But they have to have time to change with the environment. Oh, flowers. Look, that's a bug. Oh, see, look. Bug. It's blending. It's bigger. It's bigger. Okay? And here's a big thing. Individuals do not evolve. Okay? So in other words, we do not change from the DNA that we have. Let's not go into the concept of CRISPR, taking stuff out, tweaking your DNA and stuff like that. As a general sense, what we got is what we're keeping through our entire lives. So populations change. And that's important in this theory. You need to understand that individuals do not evolve. Individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. And how they're talking about populations evolving is the genetic makeup of a population changing over time. And it's really going to go into the allele frequency of populations changing over time. Oh, keep it up. So, natural selection can only increase or decrease heritable traits that vary in a population. The traits that are adaptive will vary with different environments. So, evolution is supported by an overwhelming amount of evidence. Okay? There's evidence. New discoveries continue to fill in the gaps. Four types of data, observations, homology, homo, we may remember, means the same, the fossil record, and biogeography. And obviously we're gonna go over those. I'm just guessing, okay? So, and, until we run out of time at the half hour mark, which I'm thinking my timer is gonna ding. I don't know, I haven't been paying attention. So, two example that we have. Natural selection in response to introduced species and the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria. No way! I know. Now my theory of hand sanitizer, everyone's going to be using that, okay? Which is, uh, I'm exhausted thinking about it. Okay, so. What? Oh, an introduced species. I'm like, what is a soap berry bug? I don't know. I still don't know. I looked at it, but I can look at it again. They, okay, they feed most effectively. We don't, we don't care. Okay, we don't care about them. What we do care about is how they adapt it. Okay, so in southern Florida, oh, look, that's us. Soapberry bugs feed on the larger flute of balloon vines. I don't know what that is. They have, they have longer beaks. Put the dog down. Hot. Okay, here we go. Okay, central Florida, they feed on smaller fruit. Okay. I've introduced some type of tree, they have shorter beaks. Oh, there's a picture. Do we care what it looks like? No. Do we not want to know an example of introduced species influencing what's happening to an organism that's already there? Yeah, that's the concept. Oh, look, picture, picture. Okay, so this is just telling you how it happened. In Florida, this evolution in beak size occurred in less than 35 years. That's because insects reproduce rapidly. You can make new insects in a matter of weeks. You can't make a new redwood tree in a matter of weeks. So if the climate is changing, that's going to be harder for it to adapt. Okay? So, let's see. What do we got? Drug-resistant bacteria. Okay, I'm going to pause here because I know you want to, but I'm going to um, just do the half-hour kind of thing and go from there. See if this works. I know you're excited.